As the years go by, new materials will be found, new processes discovered, and new machinery invented. With new uses, there arise new wants. New wants mean new markets, new prosperity. This world of the molecule belongs to us all. It is yours to explore your new frontier. I had a blind trust that things are on the market because they're safe. I now know that's not true. My name is Catherine, and um, this is Western Massachusetts, and this is where I live. I've been here about three years, and I spent 12 years before that in New York, in Westchester, in and out of the city. Before I got sick, I was like normal. I could do anything I wanted, and there's no way you cannot take that for granted. I studied dance and I studied writing. I had a lot of hope. I had stamina. I'm an improvisational artist and performer. I did a whole bunch of different kinds of jobs. I did PR, I did graphic design, I did a gymnastics coach stint for a while, and I ran a summer camp in the Hamptons. I danced every day, several hours a day, by myself, in my apartment, if nowhere else. I was always dancing. I was privileged and white. I still had shit, just like anybody. But I had no idea what fringe, marginalized, exiled, cast off people. I had no idea what they had to live with. I started accumulating chemical burden early. <laughs> My mom took certain pregnancy drugs while she was pregnant with me. They chemically induced my birth, and when I was six, we moved into a new house. And then seventh and eighth grade, we went to school in this really airtight, energy efficient, toxic material building. So I started experiencing health problems in college in 1989, 1990 but I started having severe life effects. I moved into an apartment in Yonkers, New York, with a new carpet and um, a leaking 1963 gas heater. I lived there for six and a half years, and every year I get sicker. I would lose more functioning, I'd become more sensitive. I was hospitalized twice, and the doctor just gave me tons of medication. By 1999, I had chronic fatigue, I had severe sinus problems, and um, I just knew that I was starting to be reactive to chemicals. But all of the specialists are expensive, really expensive, and I didn't have money. So I kept seeing my doctor at the college health center because she would let me pay over time. And then I moved um, temporarily into my friend's house in Greenwich, Connecticut, which is pesticide central. We lived next to a pond that they algae bombed regularly. Um, I lived in a house that they sprayed the lawn constantly. We lived right next to a golf course that was constantly being sprayed. And um, then they sprayed for West Nile. And that was the end of me. That was the end of life as I knew it. So then in um, 2000, a whole series of events happened in one week, and I crashed really, 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 really hard. And that's when I had to move up here. And it was when every illusion, or at least a good percentage of my illusions about reality were just blasted out of the water. I now had to ignore what the doctors say and what everybody believes and start depending on my own instincts. That day, everything, very different. 
because then I couldn't pretend another minute that it was me. I couldn't pretend another minute it was psychological. I couldn't pretend there was some way I could get around it. I couldn't pretend I can deal with this. There was no more argument left. I was pushed way past the point that I could justify, rationalize, or use any one of the million rationalizations that this culture feeds you and talks about and lives in every day. And that's what I was saying about, you know, what I want to be true and what this world tells me, tells me is true has no bearing on reality. Reality is what it is. It's a separate thing. I'm chemically sensitive. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm a female living in 2003. I'm five feet two. There's nothing I can do about it. And that was why I said it took my ego. Okay, it's April 6th, year 2000. I can't go anywhere. I can't go anywhere because everybody's spraying chemicals everywhere in my body. treat me is just as toxic if not more than all of the uh, really bad chemicals and poisons themselves I'm gonna call my guy friend hello I'm really, really sick, honey. Yes. And I had a horrible, horrible experience today. I, I really can't tell you right now. Well, it's kind of hard for me to talk to you about this stuff because you don't understand at all. And it takes a lot of energy for me to try and explain it. So I'm wondering if you can, like, come over and just, like, I don't know, hug me for a little while or something. Not make me talk. <laughs> no, I don't have the flu. I have environmental illness, honey. I have environmental illness. <clears throat> I know you would say that it's a reasonable question. The reason it's a little frustrating is that I've been telling you for months that chemicals make me sick. That's not the flu. I had to quit my job because of chemicals. You see? Chemicals make me sick. I have environmental illness. That's a better term for it than multiple chemical sensitivity because I'm not sensitive. I'm ill. I'm fucking ill. And right now I'm in a state of like really deep like talks talks I'm talked out big time. I can't go anywhere right now. I I, I don't have a mask. I have to get a mask so I can go to these places. I have to get a mask. The psychology of a human being is to fit in and to be part of culture, generally speaking. Like, we want to have friends. We want to go out in the world and have people like us. We want to participate. We want to be useful. And then 
when you get sick like this, that's all taken away. You don't always look like you're sick, you look healthy. You know you have an invisible illness. You know anything you say sounds neurotic because you look fine. The way that you cope with this illness is to go into a coping state. So you're always in a place of, I get reality, but I need to step aside from what I know to live, to be able to smile, interact with people and have any normal social demeanor or just, just getting through the day psychologically. You have to separate yourself from what, what the deepest, the deeper truth is. It took me many years to figure out why I was sick and that I even was sick. I played along with the whole mainstream thing. I played along right with it. I was right with it. Oh yeah, I must need therapy. Okay, yeah, I'm in therapy. Oh yeah, I must need pharmaceutical meds. Okay, I'm on pharmaceutical meds. Oh, I must be stressed out. Maybe I should try to relax. Oh, I need to exercise. Let me make sure I'm exercising. Oh, I need to get laid. Let me get laid. I did everything you needed. Oh, I need to make peace with my parents. Oh, yeah, I did that. Oh, I need to quit smoking. Okay. I did everything except look at my environment. And, um, I got sicker and sicker and sicker. You don't know how many times I analyzed my childhood till I finally figured out that there were a few other factors going on. It wasn't just emotional stuff. Nothing is just emotional, psychological, and our culture blames everything on that. There's an estimate that on any given day, individuals are exposed to something like between five and 600 chemical agents, either in the air, uh, in clothing, uh, in buildings, especially buildings that are sealed the way many of them are now to control climate, foodstuffs uh, that are ingested, and the problem is, very, very few of these, if any, have been evaluated. Raid contacts and kills all kinds of bugs indoors. Raid hunts them down like radar. We have a science society agreement that says we will not test people. But what we're doing is exposing millions of people and collecting no data. The Kyoto Protocol was fatally flawed. Effortlessly, economically, it's goodbye we. Our economy is slowed down in a country, in our country. We also have an energy crisis. And the idea of placing caps on CO2 does not make economic sense for America. If you are a manufacturer, you keep reading the language in the bill. It says, if you test and the results are nasty, you must report. And then it says, if you choose not to test, God bless you. That's an open invitation to say, whatever you can invent, you can put on the market. I and people like me respond very badly to man-made synthetic chemicals. Generally speaking, that means petrochemicals, petroleum byproducts, chemicals in food, pesticide, rodenticide, fumigants, insecticide, weed killer. Synthetic fragrances are in soap, cleaning agents, all manner of body products, perfume, cologne, aftershave, exhaust from anything, car, heater, furnace, building materials, carpeting, sealants like polyurethane, solvents, formaldehyde, ink, books, magazines and newspapers. 
and I absolutely cannot wear polyester or synthetic materials. If you expose me, a fragrance or a chemical, I get asthmatic, I get wheezy, I get coffee, I get mucus coming up and burning my throat. I have to spit all the time. My eyes will swell and I'll get pressure in the front of my head. I get sore, my back hurts, I'm exhausted, I'm not functional, I don't think very well, I can't organize. All of your body functions downgrade. Respiratory, mental, energy level, Digestive, reproductive, everything. And I don't have a choice of where I can work. I don't really have a choice of if I can work. I don't have a choice of where I can live. I don't have a choice of who I can talk to in person because if they're wearing perfume or anything that I can't be around, I have to get away from them. I can't hug people, some people, most people. If I want to hug them, I can't. I can't fly, so I can't visit my family and I can't be around most of them because their habits make me sick. I can't go out dancing, I can't go to movies. I can go to restaurants, but I can't use the bathrooms. And if somebody sits down with perfume on, we have to get our food to go immediately. So when I go out, I take a risk every time. I shouldn't be going to stores without a mask, but I refuse to wear a mask. I hold it over my face when I need to, but I will not just wear one. And I can judge it fairly well. I know how many times I can go out and how badly I can get exposed and how bad I can feel before I have to stop. You just learn. But I drove through five states to find this place. There are a lot of aware people. They're not aerially spraying pesticides over my house. There's a lot of chemically sensitive people up here. And they are fragrance-free offices and buildings. I have safe places that I can go. I can go to the co-op, the local co-op, and be fine until the odd person walks in and I have to leave immediately. But the little bit that I can still do, I'll be damned if I don't do it. But if I didn't want to participate in the world, I would move up to Maine, to Rangeley, and I would live in a cabin and I would breathe clean air all the time, but I would never see anyone, ever. And I'm not gonna do it. What am I gonna do? Go dance in the woods with the butterflies? That would be great. I would go nutty. And I am nutty enough, the level of isolation that I'm living now, it's about as much as I could take. I often don't have any energy, so I just lie in there. And it's all I can do sometimes just to do the dishes. It's just this strange thing of like, having to just cope with that and realize that you're so weak and your body is so strangely messed up at this point that I injure myself just by doing simple movements. It's daily functioning that I have trouble with. It is physically impossible for me to attempt working again without hurting myself. I can only do something that perfectly suits me. I can't change myself to fit like I used to into a job or a requirement. That's physically and cognitively. I'm not neurocognitively or physically reliable. I can't talk on the phone regularly. I can't always sit at the computer. If somebody, some company somewhere, were able to accommodate all of my disabilities, all of my limitations, and pay me a crap load of money for the hours I work, that would be one thing. But the problem is, I can't do enough work to make a living. I 
I have not told most of my family except for my parents that I filed for disability because it's too embarrassing. If I told my parents that I filed for Section 8, I don't know what they would do. I can't tell them that I filed for subsidized housing. They would be so ashamed. I'm disabled. They don't want to think that I'm disabled. But I am. I don't want to think that I'm dis I don't want to, I don't want to say the word. But it's true. I mean, the fact of the matter is, and if you like take the stigma away from it, all it means is I can't do substantial gainful employment. The only reason I'm standing right here is because I have had people care about me and because certain systems have come through for me, even if minimally. I started getting welfare, food stamps, fuel assistance. Because I have the cognitive problems, I'll sit at that computer and sit with my checkbook sometimes, some weeks for a half an hour every night trying to figure out how to make it, you know? because I can't do the numbers very well and I get like, what? And then I forget this and then I forget that and I, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. It's really challenging. But it took just under two years for me to get approved for disability after I first filed, after numerous denials saying that I could grasp objects and that I could stand up. So you'll go into an allopathic doctor's office, right? And you'll be like, totally depressed <laughs> because your life sucks right now and you need their help for something and um you're depressed because you're sick and nobody can help you you're not depressed and thus imagining that you're sick my periods never changed in my whole life except for when i got pesticide poisoned and my period has completely gotten fucked up and i still have cramps i've had cramps for like three weeks so i go to the doctor and I'm telling her my symptoms and stuff. And, um, you know, but she said that that's normal. And, um, the reason that I'm upset by that, <clears throat> what she's doing is comparing me to what I believe to be a lower standard of health. And I'm sorry, just because she sees it all the time doesn't mean that that is healthy. So this doctor never took my medical history and never wrote down and never really, and she asked me if I was allergic to medication or if I'd ever had surgery. And when I asked her when she was gonna write down all the rest of my symptoms, she just said, oh, you mean your little sore things here? Meanwhile, I can't fucking work. I can't go anywhere. I'm stuck in my fucking house. I don't any longer give myself to doctors. Traditional allopathic mainstream doctors. They can't do anything for me, pretty much. They can sign things. They can say, yes, she is sick. They can say she needs a medical exception. They can say she is disabled. If I had seen a specialist when I needed one, I probably wouldn't be disabled. My current doctor's treatment, my specialist. Some of what he does is paid for, but most of it is stuff that I don't need. Stuff that could really help me is not paid for. There are a number of things we can do. That is the first step, though. The first step is to avoid exposures, there's no question. The second step is to take any load, such as food allergies, away from the system. A third aspect of treatment uh, is to fix the nutritional deficiencies, and then we can do a detoxification program. So you change your lifestyle, you avoid exposures, you take oxygen. You get an IV and feel a little better afterwards. Most of us have to change our diet. I mean, I take supplements. And I don't eat anything artificial. That's it. The people who have the most recovery were poisoned for the least time. I had a long-term exposure. Seven years. Just breathe in and out. It's a nice deep breath, just in and out. Tune into it. And I'm starting to draw it into my hand, drawing it out. I'm feeling it here, and pop. Since I haven't been out in the workforce, things have improved. My body has been able to rest. 
and that's the whole point. My body needs a great deal of rest. It's all about time. Like, I have to wait to feel better. I have to wait for my body to heal itself and hope that it does. Like, after reaction, I take whatever I can take, I do whatever I can do, and then I just go, okay, now God and my body have to do the rest in nature because I, there's nothing more I can do. I am coated with perfume. As soon as I get the smell off of my skin, out of my hair, I have the chance to start feeling better. It's out of your control. Healing is a natural process. You cannot force healing. And that's the opposite of the chemical culture. Chemicals are, we're going to make it do what we want, when we want, how we want. It's this really pathological control problem. I'm in New York. It's a place I shouldn't be. Hopefully this is one of the last times I come here. I haven't been here in like a year and a half, to my knowledge. <sighs> it's freezing, it's like 30 degrees. Um, and I really need to wash my hair. <sighs> I'm gonna attempt to wash my hair and my face outside because I'm staying at John's, but I can't use his bathroom because it's totally scented and toxic for me. And so, Basically what I'm going to show you is that I would rather freeze my ass off and have the cops come and like yell at me like a homeless person and tell me that I can't wash my hair in public or something. I don't know because they think you're weird. People think you're weird or homeless and then they're like, oh, you're homeless and loitering. You can't be. You can't be whatever you're being. So I'll show you how I parked my car so I wouldn't be visible. It's the best place I could find. Because I don't want to do a too secluded area because I'm female. And, you know, I don't want to, and I'm alone. I don't want to attract a weird... Okay, please, nobody come and make fun of me. Please. Okay, I'm going to get out desperate, cold, does not fucking phase you. Our culture blames everything on the individual. The culture is, you're not doing enough. You're not working hard enough. You don't have a good enough attitude. We have a messed up culture in this way. We're just getting unhealthier and unhealthier and unhealthier and we're all just working really hard to cope and we've lost sight of the fact that life is not supposed to be like that. Quality of life. I mean, it's not just cancer, it's now. It's mood problems, it's reproduction. Oh, my penis doesn't work anymore. I'll get the Viagra. Why doesn't your penis work anymore? You don't wanna ask that question? No, they don't. Just give me the Viagra. I wanna fuck my wife, thanks. I gotta go to work tomorrow. I don't have time to think about why I don't get an erection. There isn't any time. It's the American way. We're living longer, but we're on tons of meds. And what's really fucked up about globalization and capitalization and big corporations and all that is when you make it that big, then one person no longer matters. One person is expendable because it's the company we're worried about. Nobody can take responsibility. Who can you blame it on? We are um, political economy rejects. Our economy is built on making chemicals and pharmaceuticals and my illness threatens that, therefore 
and expendable. A whole segment of the population is considered acceptable risk. Billions of dollars in lost productivity and medical costs and health costs. What's it to you? I don't personally think it's worth it. The chemical industry does. That might have something to do with the billions of dollars they're making. <laughs> Pesticides are known to have these certain effects. They'll cause depression or aggression, reproductive problems. And then you've got the same industry benefiting from making drugs to treat the things that pesticide exposure cause. If everybody lived like chemically sensitive people, who would be buying all the bounce? Who would be buying all of the pesticide? Who would be buying all the scented candles? Who would be buying all of the super toxic air freshener? So the chemical industry is putting millions of dollars into making sure the information that is out there is discredited. The, the question has been up to now, getting anyone to understand that possibly this is real. And that's what our mice do. Perfumes are asthma triggers, allergenic and toxic. Fabric softeners, all the ones that we have been able to try, have been seriously toxic. We had tested hundreds of carpets, plastic toys, shower curtains, we've done paints of all kinds, and we're learning more and more that the commercial products that we're buying are very frequently thoroughly nasty. The next day after the two exposures to the Grafton carpet, Mouse number two was found dead. My responsivity is heightened. That doesn't mean that other people are not reacting. There's all sorts of different reactions that people are having to pollutants and chemicals. We are all being affected and it just shows up differently or shows up later. Some people have allergies. Why does everybody have cancer? I mean, I'm preaching, I'm an alarm, and it's up to everybody else whether they're gonna listen or not, you know. Those people's minds are controlled. They're controlled to such an extent that now, when you see something with your own eyes, it has less meaning for you than if you see a report from a larger institution that had been approved by some other institution. All of a sudden, people believe it. Their own personal experience means nothing to them anymore. What means something to them is someone outside of them, larger than them, telling them what's what so that they don't have to think for themselves. So they don't have to take responsibility for the larger reality. I'm, I'm gonna rinse off in the shower. Because it's just too much. Too hard or too depressing. Or too real. I've had more than one person in my life tell me I was too real. And that they just couldn't deal with that. It's good to feel blood rushing to my skin and my head and my poor toxed out brain. I do a lot of waiting to feel better, but I also feel like there's a lot of waiting. When do I get to dance again? So here's what I want. When people see me dance, I want them to know that it's a miracle. That's what I want because it is.
and it's one of the things that I have left. I'm getting a little better, but it's very um, fragile. But I'm able to survive right now. I've got my working car, I've got my safe house. I've got a therapist, I've got a healer. I'm not dating any psychos. I'm learning how to create the world that works for me and, and keeps me healthy and sane. I want people to get informed, that's what I want. And you know what, you're not gonna get that on the news. I still wanna be famous, rich, and like change the world and save the world. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna work to do that and to dance, but. I have achieved a level of contentment with just being, like a, a coming to peace with just existing that I never had before. So I have to say, that you know, after going through some of this to find the answer, I have to say that this is difficult for me to live this way, yes. I hate it, but it has redeeming qualities. <laughs> I'm closer to God or whatever. I have more of my spirit. I can miss my body all I want, but I'm a richer woman. I have no idea why I started videotaping myself originally. I would use the camera to film myself dancing. And I thought maybe I could use footage of my dancing to try to choreograph. But if you want to get into deeper layers of it, I felt as a kid that I didn't have any witness. There were no witnesses to yeah. stuff I went through with my family, with my siblings. I felt very alone and um, there was never anybody there to see, to share it with me. So um, I would say some of the inspiration later to tape myself came out of, okay, now I'm gonna have a witness. So when I got sick, really sick, to the point where I couldn't deny any longer that I was sick, <clears throat> that's all I had was the camera. All I could think was, this shit's gonna try and wipe me off the face of the fucking planet. I can record every last minute of it and what it was like for me. And if it can be useful to somebody else, you know, that redeems my suffering.